Uh, Erev Tov, good evening. Uh, we want to thank Pastor Mike Fryer from Father's House for inviting us to make this recording in commemoration of the 27th of January, International Holocaust and Genocide Day. And we decided, uh, Steffi and myself, if I'm, to conduct this as a interview where Steffi and myself will uh, discuss questions concerning the relevance of Holocaust education today. I'd like to introduce Stephanie McMahon Kay, who worked at Yad Vashem at the International School for Holocaust Studies for more than 20 years in the department for international seminars. And myself, Define Kay, uh, that worked at Yad Vashem uh, for more than 30 years and directed the department uh, for international seminars. I'd like to ask my colleague, it's also my wife, a Steffi, why do you think it's so important to teach Holocaust studies today? Well, let's begin with today. Where are we in the 21st century? Just in general, in my view, there is a tremendous push to propagandize society. We're constantly bombarded with advertising, with what's considered to be the truth in some circles. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But there is this overarching sentiment of, we're going to give you the truth. News, fake news, some yes, some no. So for me as an educator, my first goal with the upcoming generation, and I guess I have to say my concern as a human being, is that we are not presently creating critical thinkers. We live in a world of sound bites, and that seems to work for kids today. Don't tell me the whole history, just bottom line it for me. Give me the quick answer. Well, Quick answers are not thinking. Quick answers cannot make for a safe and peaceful and productive and kind world. So not that anyone's inviting me, but if I were the minister of education anywhere in the world. I'd vote for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's one. Um, but if I had a post of some importance, what I would want to see taught in the schools would not be math, in part because I'm terrible at math, but at least not math in the traditional way. I would want to see education primarily focused on critical thinking and moral and ethical education in across the curriculum in every way possible. And how does the Holocaust feed into that? The Holocaust is the perfect vehicle for that because the Holocaust not only being the, the most extreme event of genocide in the 20th century, crosses all kinds of curriculum in terms of drawing our students in, of, of fascinating them, of tapping into their curiosity, of looking at it on various levels. Clearly, we have to teach the Holocaust as an historical event. It's very morbid, though. There are so many morbid details and death and destruction. And that happens to be the reality of this particular situation. Again, I'm going to reflect back to the world we live in. Don't tell me anything ugly. Just show me the pretty stuff. But that's not reality. And it will not be the reality that generation after generation faces as it goes out into the world to take their command positions as, as that generation. So how does the Holocaust humanize us? Again, I'm going to reflect back to the critical thinking skills. We look at an event, an historical event, that, by the way, was also heavily propagandized by the Nazi regime. So, you know, the, worth, the world turns and some things happen again and again. But it humanizes us when we can take an empathetic approach along with critical thinking to the historical 
narrative that is the Holocaust. How do you teach empathy through the Holocaust? With stories. Okay. Always with stories. Did you have a story for us? And of course, a lot of, of critical uh, timeline, historical narrative timeline. Before we go to the stories, I want to emphasize how important it is that we don't shy away from the history, from the darkness, from the propaganda, from the murder, from the genocide. These are historical facts, and we need to approach them critically. We need to approach them as thinking intellectuals, and we need to approach them as empathetic human beings on the planet. Part of the advantages of Holocaust education are its ability to have implications that are universal, along with that which is unique to the Holocaust. Now, when we look at the implications that are universal, I want to reflect on, again, the moral and ethical approach. Yes, there's a lot of darkness in the Holocaust. There's a lot of brutality. There's a lot of death and destruction. But there's also what I'm going to call points of light. Yeah. And one of those points of light that I'd like to reflect on now is the story of a Christian community in France called Le Chambon sur Lyon. It's a community of Huguenot believers who lived exactly by scripture, devoted their lives to the study of scripture in their daily lives, and lived their lives according to what they believed God was telling them through the Bible. So in this community, you have a whole village and many villages 5,000 Huguenots who saved between 3,500 and 5,000 Jews because that's what they believed God was calling them to do. So there was this communal response to moral and, uh, moral and ethical behavior that I believe also had this element of critical thinking. But I want to also emphasize the fact that in this community, it wasn't just a communal effort. It was individual effort. And that's where it began. Individuals who took in Jews or made decisions based on their unique relationship with the Bible and with the God that they served. Can you say a few words about Pastor Trochman and his wife Magda? Oh, he was he was a force to be reckoned with. Charismatic, uh, determined. He took scripture at the literal, the most literal word. And his wife was kind of a firecracker. I mean, she was Italian and Russian, and he had clearly met his match. And they both, in their own individual decision-making process, determined that this was an important thing to do, as did almost the entire community of the plateau where Le Chambon sits. But then it became also a communal effort with Pastor Trachme at the helm. That's very, very beautiful. And I hear what you're saying. And I would like to add a few comments. A, in my perspective, one of the most important elements of teaching Holocaust education today, what makes it so relevant, is the resurgence of anti-Semitism, of this new anti-Semitism that we're being bombarded with in the 21st century. More and more, the a movement to try and depict Israel as an apartheid state, the BDS campuses, and places where you would think of higher education, where there's an intellectual atmosphere, it's specifically those places where you're finding pockets of hate and uh, anti-Semitism at levels that are unprecedented. So one of the uh, facets I'd like to add to what the interesting examples you brought, Steffi, is the ability to combat this re resurgence of anti-Semitism by teaching the dangers of the historical uh, events of the Holocaust uh, that happened over close to 80 years ago. And I'd like to tell a little story myself, since we're both storytellers and we love telling stories. And I think it fits into exactly uh, what you were telling us about Pastor Trochme and his wife, Magda. 
But this is, these are two Holocaust survivors, Nachum and Genya Menor. They live today in Be'er Sheva. He's 96. She's 93. Uh, thank God they're both healthy. But their story begins in Krakow in 1939 with the Nazi occupation, where they were both working in Schindler's factory. And he was a farm mechanic. She worked the lorry to produce the pots and pans of the German army. And boy meets girl, girl meets boy, and they fell in love there at Chino's factory. Uh, she was 17, he was 21. The war ends, and Nahum looked for his family. His family was all sent to Belgium's death camp in 1942. Parents, brothers, and sisters. Uh, Genya, the mother, uh, brother and father were in Chimla's factory. The father passed away. He was sick. He was taken out and shot in Pleshov. But her mother and brother did survive. And the war is over. They go back to Krakow. And Nachum as well looked for his family. But his promise coming from a very Zionist family was to come then to the land of Israel under the British mandate of Palestine. He got out of one of the first boats, came to the British mandate of Palestine, the land of Israel, and became a wireless operator on the illegal ships that brought immigrants to the, to the land of Israel. They didn't see each other for three years, but he made a promise to her that he proposed to her in Shunless factory during the war, that if they survive, he wants to marry her in a small town outside of Tel Aviv called Givatayim, where he had lived as a small child uh, before the family actually returned to Poland before World War II. In December 1949, after the creation of the State of Israel, Kenya leaves Poland, leaves her mother and brother, and comes to the State of Israel. On January 17, 1950, Nahum and Kenya were married in a small town outside of Tel Aviv called Gibatai. There were hardly 10 people at the celebration. Her family was in Poland. His family did not exist. They were murdered. And on January 17th, the year 2000, they were celebrating the 50th wedding anniversary. Stephanie and I were there. There was a group of Australian educators. We went up to Shindler's Grave on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And there on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, for the 50th wedding anniversary, Nachum and Ginya brought their daughter, the son, three, four grandchildren that, that were alive at that, mo at that moment. And they stood there as a family. And as I'm looking at them, I'm reminded that scene in Schindler's List, where at the end of the film, the survivors give Oscar Schindler a gold ring, a gold ring that they took the fillings from one of the survivors and in inscribed inside the gold ring, a verse from Talmud. One who saves a single life as if he saved an entire world. And they gave it to Oscar Schindler. And there, on January 17th, year 2000, you could see that this couple personified what this one righteous among the nation did. He didn't save just Nahum and Genya, but countless future generations that you could see right there. I want to turn to you. We want to turn to you. And we want to thank you, hey, Pastor Mike Fryer and the entire congregation, for allowing this opportunity to talk to you, not for very long, but as instructed by our Commander in Chief, Mike Fryer. And we wish you all, may God bless you, keep you health and prosperity. Thank you very much for listening to us. Good night.